Recently, I've been uh, reading a, a book that has helped me immensely. It's by David Calhoun, who taught at uh, Covenant Seminary for years and recently retired on Calvin's Institutes. I don't know if you've ever seen Calvin's Institutes, but they're pretty heavy and weighty and long, uh, you know, maybe 2,000 pages uh, there. But he's written this uh, shorter book that kind of summarizes reading through uh, and highlighting what the Institutes by John Calvin were all about. And that uh, uh, one spot just really helped me in that book. Um, it brought up one of the most uh, significant issues that the reformers dealt with uh, in the idea of assurance. How do I know that, how do you know that you're elect? Have you ever asked yourself that question before? How do you know uh, that God has chosen you before the foundation of the world? And the Roman Catholic answer, even today, is still, well, you can't know that. Uh, there is no assurance, uh, because if you tell people and they, that they can have assurance of their election, then they won't do good works. They won't pursue a godly life. They won't uh, live for God. They'll just goof off as, as Christians. Yes, that's, that's really what, what is there. And so assurance really, it was only for the dying. When you know there's no more opportunity to do good works, then you can maybe assure people on their deathbed and give them the last rites, and then they're, they're, they're ready for heaven or sometimes just purgatory. But anyway, what, I want to ask that question. What, what does the scripture really say about assurance? And it's a broad topic. I'm just going to give you a few minutes here. Uh, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, uh, John tells us why he wrote his first uh, uh, epistle. And he writes and says, I write these things to you that you may know that you have eternal life. And so the purpose of the book of 1 John is to tell people how you know you have eternal life, how you know you re really elect. And he comes up with three and maybe a fourth um, test. Uh, you remember those tests? You, know, you must confess that Jesus has come in the flesh. Remember that, that, that Jesus is God-man. God He's not... He's not one or the other. He's both. So that's the theological test. The second one John gives, and he gives them all, at least three times each of these in 1 John. You can read through it this week and see it. You must love uh, one another. You must love the church. And that's the social test. The third test that John gives is you must obey my commandments, the moral test. And then even a fourth one that you must have an anointing of the spirit. He talks about that. Uh, the, the, as Paul talks about the Spirit testifying with our spirit that we are the children of God. And so there's an inner testimony of the Spirit. All four of those you should be looking for and should be there at some level. But the, the sensitive conscience, if you follow me on this, will always doubt something about, doubt themselves. Um, is the quality of my faith good enough? Is it the real faith or is it a phony faith? Uh, do I love others enough? Uh, do I obey God often enough? Do I uh, have, an, is the anointing real enough? Those kind of questions creep in. And I say enough to those kind of questions. Because I think scripture gives us an answer that is uh, even beyond that. Uh, Calvin said one time that faith totters when it pays attention to works. If you look at your works, your faith will totter. And I think that's, that, if it's the main focus, that's true. And so uh, Calvin, and I, I kind of pursued this beyond uh, David Calhoun's book, and looking at the, the, the uh, institutes about this, and Calvin one time said, rare indeed is the mind that is not repeatedly struck with this thought, whence comes your salvation but from God's election? Now what revelation do I have of your election? This thought, if it is impressed itself upon him either continually, strikes him in his misery with harsh torments or utterly overwhelms them. In other words, Calvin is saying that, that if you think about that too long, then you'll be overwhelmed at the fact that you just don't believe enough or you don't live the Christian life well enough. Um, one of the quotations of, in this book uh, by another scholar says that, that if one had to contribute even only a pebble to one's own salvation, one would live in lifelong fear that one's pebble was just not big enough. You follow that? You don't wonder, what, am I living enough? Am I obeying enough? Am I, am I 
am I, did I really have that anointing of the Spirit as he testified to me? And you can drive yourself crazy. And Calvin brings that out and says, sure. But he says there's two ways uh, to uh, answer the question. There's the right way of finding whether you're elect and the wrong way. And he calls the wrong way the outside the way. He said the wrong way is to speculate. The wrong way is to try to read God's mind. The wrong way is to uh, try to investigate God's eternal purposes. You can't get to that. I can't get to that. None of us can get to that. Or to look for a sign from God. He says, uh, Calvin says at one point, uh, we must not attempt to break into the inner recesses of divine wisdom in order to find out what decision has been made concerning ourselves at God's judgment seat. So that's the wrong way. Go the way of speculation, thinking, oh, well, and a lot of people try to perceive that. I feel this, or uh, somebody's given me a sign, or we give a, a, a spiritual gift will tell me that I'm truly saved from someone. And, and Calvin says that's just a, 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 a way of going down uh, a, a wrong pathway. Uh, and so the right way is to look outside of yourself and look uh, to Christ, look to Christ. And that's what he says. He says, Christ is the mirror wherein we must, and without self-deception, may contemplate our own election. Christ, you look to him, you don't look to yourself. In, a, in his uh, uh, sermon on Ephesians 1, he, he's, he talks about um, the double way. God looks into the mirror and he sees Christ. And we look into the mirror from our perspective and we see Christ. And he says this, says, Jesus Christ is the mirror in which God beholds us when he wishes to find us acceptable to himself. Likewise, on our side, he is the mirror on which we must cast our eyes and look, and when we desire to come to the knowledge of our election. So it, it, you look outside, not how you feel, how you think, or speculate to God's eternal uh, uh, plan, but you, you look to Christ and you find your election in Christ. Because he's elect and because you're connected to him by faith, then you are elect. That's basically what he is saying there. Uh, don't look that always. Says, Unless we look straight toward Christ, he says in the Institutes, we shall wander through endless uh, 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 tunnels, endless tunnels. Mm -hmm. um, he says, and goes on beyond that, he says, we shall not find assurance in our election in ourselves, and not even in God the Father. He goes that far. Not, don't find it in God the Father if we conceive of him severed from the Son, Jesus. Christ then is the mirror wherein we must and without self-deception may contemplate our own, our own election. And so uh, we find in Christ all that we need. He says one more line. Uh, he says, how insane we are to seek outside of him what we already have obtained in him and can find in him alone. So it's in Christ alone. We look to him. When you doubt, when you fear, you wonder whether you pass the tests of 1 John, don't look to yourself uh, only. I mean, you look at those things a little bit. That's, that, they're the given for us to look at. We should have some semblance of passing those tests, but, but uh, not completely because we'll fail. So look outside of yourself. Look uh, to Christ. But you might say, and I just want to close with this, we, we, might, we might say, uh, but we need faith. And interesting enough, uh, faith for Calvin was assurance. He says at one point, faith is assurance. We sometimes separate those two, don't we? But if you have faith, even the smallest faith, as a faith of a mustard seed, if it's directed toward Christ, then that should be enough assurance for you. That your, your assurance is not uh, in your faith, but it's assurance that God has given you the gift of faith, and therefore you are elect. Another way of putting it is we wouldn't have any faith if we were not elect. We wouldn't have any faith at all. We wouldn't even be asking those questions usually, unless the Lord... Uh, has given us faith. Or to go a little further in history, Charles Spurgeon said it this way, he said, I believe the doctrine of election because I am quite certain that if God did not choose me, I should never have chosen him. The fact that I've chosen him on some level at least gives us assurance that he has chosen us. And that's what really what Calvin was saying, that, that our faith is our assurance that if we have some faith at all in Christ, then we uh, can be assured that we are in him and therefore safe. And so we sometimes can make faith into kind of a work, a kind of heart work that we have to work up to get to a certain point to really be uh, able to come in, in trust in Christ. But faith is merely a gift. It's, it's merely God, a God-given response 
to hearing of the great truth. And we hear the great truths of the gospel. We hear that Christ died for us. We hear that he rose for us. We hear the great things he's done for us. We respond in faith, and that faith uh, is, uh, is an assurance to us of our election. So it is it's God's way of, of connecting to Christ, us to Christ. And so well, when it comes to saving faith, you either, either have it or you don't have it. And if you have faith in Christ, then you have it, <laughs> or you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't be elect at all. You wouldn't be trusting Christ at all. Now, what does the scripture say this? Um, you know, it doesn't work through some of these things, uh, you know, uh, some of the arguments that Paul or another writer of scripture would, would, would focus on, but it does tell us, it keeps pointing us back to Christ over and over again. I read to you at the end of the sermon this morning from Hebrews 12, that let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. That's really what Calvin is saying here, is what, Paul, what the writer of Hebrews says is we focus on him. We don't focus on ourselves. We focus on fixing our eyes on Jesus, who's the originator of our faith. In other words, he gives us our faith, and then he perfects that faith in our lives. And he says, and then he naturally, right in that same passage, says, who uh, for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning the shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What, what is the high value Hebrews turning us up to? Focus yourself on Christ and what he's done. He's died for you, he's gone through uh, everything for you, and then he's also risen and he's in, seated at the right hand. He's done. So faith responds to that, and we just keep looking back to Jesus. I just took a short uh, survey of John's gospel and just went through it this week, just skimmed through it. Uh, and, and over and over again, we find people pointing to Jesus. And we tend to think, well, this is for them to believe, and certainly that's true, so they see Christ for the first time. But it's to see Christ all the time. That same way, the gospel is not just for unbelievers. John's gospel is for, for all of us. And so John says and, and points to Jesus, John the Baptist. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's pointing to Christ. Look to Christ. Look to Christ. Same thing is what we're talking about here. Or Philip uh, points uh, Nathaniel to Christ and says, come and see, come and see, in, in, uh, uh, in the first chapter as well. In the third chapter, it's Nicodemus and then John follows it up with, with saying uh, Moses, as, as the Israelites looked to the serpent in the wilderness. So uh, we, we look to Christ. And when he's risen up, then all men are drawn uh, to him. In chapter 4, it's the, uh, the woman at the well who points the Samaritans to Christ, to come, see, see Christ, and, and they believe. In chapter 6, we're told we're to eat of Christ. Uh, really graphic. Uh, terminology that Jesus uses, the eat of him, uh, pointing to himself as the only way. In chapter 7, we're to drink of him. Come to me and drink. You'll be, you'll be satisfied. In chapter 8, he's the light that we must see. In chapter 10, he's the gate we must go through. In chapter 11, he's the life and the resurrection that we must have to live. In chapter 14, he's the way we must be on, the way, the truth, and the life. In chapter 15, uh, he is the vine that we must remain in and connected to. Chapter 17, the son is glorified at the cross and, and lifted up that he might be, that people might come and be drawn to him. In chapter 20 even, it's Mary, remember in the garden, who turns around and has to see Jesus first, see the resurrection of Christ. They're all looking at Christ, all through the gospel, and we're being pointed to Christ. And really, John's gospel is really what the rest of the New Testament does and really what the whole scriptures do is point to Christ. So look outside of yourself. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. And then you don't have to go down these dark tunnels that Calvin talks about of doubt and wondering and, 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 uh, and, and fearing uh, these things. Uh, you'll be, your trust is in him and he will save you. You cannot save yourself. I can't save myself. He must be the one. And so that really summarizes the, one of the great emphasis of the, of, the, of the Reformation, that we are ones who look to Christ and to him alone. And he saves us by his grace alone. And we trust in him. And our faith is, is a gift that connects us to him so that we can have all his benefits. So just be encouraged uh, this Reformation Sunday that the Lord uh, uh, wants you to have assurance. He wants you to know. He writes these things to you that you may know that you have eternal life uh, and then be, uh, to live in the joy 
and uh, of that and the, the uh, assurance of that every single day. Uh, we belong. When you wake up tomorrow morning, remember, remind yourself uh, that you belong and you're elected in Christ. Um, and not because you feel good that morning. <laughs> you may feel terrible tomorrow morning. Uh, but because Christ has said it, because he's given you faith and that he will not fail you. He will not fail you. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's have some prayer together. Father, we do thank you for the, the great truth that we can know that we are yours and that you have loved us long before we ever had any love for you. And that we are, can be assured of that all the way through our life. Um, the Bruce could not write, as we, we know, the things he wrote to his wife without having that assurance that know that he is yours. And, and so, Lord, help us as we go through our lives, as difficult things come to us, to not look to ourselves, but to look to you. And keep looking, keep looking to you, the author and perfecter of our faith. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.